Hi everyone, my name is David Kelly. I'm the Program Director for the eLearning Guild and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another TWIST conversation. This afternoon I'm, I'm pleased to be welcoming Tracy Parrish and Trina Rimmer who are going to be joining me for a discussion about adapting eLearning practices for the real world environment. Welcome guys. Thank you, hi. Hey, thanks David. Why don't you, uh, to get started, why don't each of you just take a moment to introduce yourself. Trina, if you could start. Sure. Uh, so uh, I'm Trina Rimmer. I'm a 15-year uh, instructional design uh, junkie. <laughs> uh, definitely a learning geek. Um, and uh, I have developed some ideas over the years around uh, the, the, the gap that you referred to around, uh, you know, sort of adapting uh, e-learning for, uh, for the real world and excited to talk about that. And I'm um, Tracy Parrish. I work in healthcare doing instructional design and development. And I've been doing that for a long time now. But uh, it's a real world situation where things are thrown at me constantly with uh, all sorts of wrenches thrown in each day as well. So it really helps bring uh, that perspective to the workshop. Yeah, and this idea of the real world, a lot of us have come into this field um, accidentally or, or just learning as we go. And, and when you learn how to do something, a lot of times you go to go to a class and they teach you how to do follow this particular model or how to do this particular workflow as it relates to, to using a tool or, or creating an e-learning project and then you take that that classroom foundational knowledge and you bring it back to the workplace and it doesn't just fit perfectly <laughs> you have to adapt to the real world so can you can you give me an idea both of you have worked in the real world with a lot of different organizations can you give me an idea of how, how what sort of gaps exist between the, this this content of how to do it and how you have to adapt that for the real world. Well, you know, I found the real world is populated with people, and people are messy. <laughs> <laughs> they make they make all those models and those nice streamlined processes really complicated. <laughs> um, there's different personalities. There's uh, you know there's a. Uh, 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 unrealistic expectations from stakeholders that aren't well managed. Um, there's uh, overly aggressive timelines. There's never enough budget or resources. Um, it just it, it occurred to me, uh, you know, as I was uh, sort of working my way through uh, corporate America for for many years, um, that um, that this was not just symptomatic of one corporate environment. This was pretty much every place I worked um, where we were up against these things. So the models didn't prepare me to deal with those realities. The models spoke to an ideal that I have yet to experience. Tracy, what do you think? Yeah, it's there's it's always this very linear process that you're taught that you're going to get the you're going to meet with the SME and you're going to work through the process and it's all very timed out and perfectly planned and you know, in the last two days I've had eight projects thrown at me that all need to be done by September not sure how I'm going to juggle them all. So that kind of thing happens every day to all of us. Yeah, I was having a conversation um, earlier today with someone in the realm of performance support talking about how training has its place, but training gives you a foundational knowledge that in many ways is, is if all conditions were perfect. And then you go into the real world and where you really start learning is how you deal with those exceptions. And when we deal with what we're dealing with in terms of developing e-learning, you have to work around exceptions all the time. I know one of the biggest exceptions, you know, in terms of this is how you do something in e-learning from a, from a, this is the expert telling you how to do it and then you have to go apply it, is a lot of times the expert is dealing with all the resources on the, on the planet. And this is how you create this wonderful e-learning module, uh, but they have every resource that's possibly available. And then you go back and you say, well, this is what I need. And they say, well, you don't have money for that. So. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with one of the biggest challenges with working in the real world is the the dealing with limited resources and limited budget. So how do you work around that in terms of a project? Well, um, uh, Tracy actually is probably more of an expert on this topic than I am because I know that's something that she encounters in her environment a lot. But I will say that um, some of the things that I've um, come across are um, I have become an expert in cataloging all that is free on the internet. <laughs> Um, and certainly, going to events like DevLearn too, you uh, you do get to you DevLearn and Learning Solutions, for that matter. You get to uh, meet others who have their sort of own little um, workarounds and catalogs of free resources. And the networking that you get at those events is essential to helping you build kind of an arsenal of uh, of tools that will support you in doing what you need to do with the limited resources you've got. I find too that those networks that we start building with other people, it's more of a, it's also a support network where you realize that, you know, we get these ideas in our minds that we have to have these amazing 
fantastic pieces of work that come out of our, our little production studios. And in the end, sometimes we have to pull ourselves back and go, you know what, these are the resources we have, this is the best we're going to be able to do in the time frame that we have too. And sort of pushing ourselves back down from that Superman model that we could make of ourselves, or that you know Cadillac model yeah. of learning and back down to maybe the Pinto is going to be good enough. <laughs> Well, you know, I think that there's something to be said for that because I will say that, you know, a lot of the examples that you see of e-learning um, out there are things that are have been done by professional graphic artists or professional, you know, um, computer programmers. They're sophisticated, they're sleek, they're elegant, they've got all of these bells and whistles and you're thinking, gosh, you know, this simple thing that I've done sort of pales in comparison, but when you factor in um, the limited resources, the aggressive timelines that you're given, it, it hopefully it gives you the perspective of, well, you know, maybe this isn't so bad after all. Maybe this is pretty darn good, actually. And that, taps, that actually gets into another aspect of, of dealing with the real world that, that I'd like to get your perspective on. The, this idea that you have to manage the expectations of who your audience is. It's not just instructional design or being an e-learning developer in many ways is not just about design and development. A lot of times there's a management level aspect of it just from the standpoint of managing the expectations of people. Uh, if, if someone comes to me and says that I ha they have a project and I'm going to make it the, the pedestal project that's going to be the most beautiful thing in the world and then I come back to them and I say this is what it costs and they say um, that's ten times what I expected it to cost, that's, that's not managing expectations well. So there's this project management piece that if I'm an e-learning designer and developer that is critical. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how, that, how you see project management fitting into the instructional design e-learning developer skill set? Well, uh, you know, I've had the conversations about with this with lots of folks in the industry because I think we've all recognized to some extent that this is one of the great um, sort of um, uh, unlisted job expectations of an instructional designer in a typical, uh, you know, workplace is that you do need to have some project management abilities because you've got um, the, the managing expectations situation that you were just referring to. Um, I, you know, I think that one of the trickier things is that it's not a formal part of any instructional design program that I'm aware of. Um, if you want to take a separate, you know, sort of project management uh, certification program, those are obviously um, very valuable to folks in this role, but they're also expensive, and not everybody works in an environment that's going to encourage or pay for that kind of training. So I think that a lot of us have become sort of, um, you know, amateur project managers uh, just by default. You, 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 you're, you know, you're going to choke if you don't get out there and, and learn these skills. And, uh, and I think to some extent that, um, that people who are successful instructional designers are also pretty decent project managers. Absolutely. Tracy, anything you'd add to that? No, I think, I think Trina's got it well there. For me, I'm getting to the point where I'm lucky enough that I've been in an organiz organization long enough that I can sit there and show examples, real, world, real examples that people are familiar with and say, if you want it to look like this, then it's going to take this amount of time. But if you remember this type of course, that's the down and dirty version, that's what we can do quickly in the time frame you're giving me. So being able to sh at least show them too, sometimes those show pieces, to let them know what it's going to look like, helps out as well. Yeah, absolutely. The examples can definitely help uh, facilitate that negotiation. I've experienced that myself a number of times. I know you guys are going to be at DevLearn this October doing a workshop that basically explores this idea of adapting the adapting e-learning for the real world, and, and it's going to touch on all the things that we've already talked about. So if I'm going to be com coming to DevLearn and sitting in your workshop, can you give me an idea of what that full day experience is going to be like as you take a deeper dive into these topics? Well, um, I can tell you that um, this workshop is designed to be um, sort of process and model agnostic. So in other words, if you've got an existing process or design model that you're following, um, what we're going to talk about in this workshop is going to work for you because really it's about flexing your prox process, not having such a rigid adherence to your process. I think a lot of instructional designers um, as kind of beat themselves up because they feel like if they're not following Addy, for instance, to a T, they're somehow failing to be a good designer. And so I think that um, if you have to adjust your uh, process incrementally on the fly, that's perfectly appropriate. I think that's how people work realistically, and I don't think that makes you a bad designer. So in our workshop, my focus is really on um, creating um, a real-world kind of simulation of um, a typical work environment. And Tracy and I don our SME hats, 
Mm -hmm. And uh, we put you through your paces, but at the end of it, we hope that you come out with some new strategies, some new tools, um, some new coping techniques, um, and uh, and definitely some fresh perspective on what it is to be a good designer. I think to be a good designer, it's about understanding what your options are and choosing the best one as you go along. Yeah, and we've designed it to be a real uh, collaborative learning environment too. There's a lot of networking with one another within the room, so that we're not just it's not just us spewing the information. We're we're learning what everyone in the room is deal doing, dealing with, and how they're coping with it too. Excellent. I love I love the framework that you've you've painted that with. Just using Addy as an example, that a lot of people have, whether it's Addy or whatever model, they look at it as more as a rule more than a guideline, or mm -hmm. or, or more than just the scaffolding to help them. That they that gives a little bit of structure, but still gives you the ability to adapt. So approaching it from that perspective, I think, is going to be very helpful for people. Yeah, I mean, uh, the feedback I've gotten over the years is that people have said it's really changed their perspective um, on their jobs because they've come into this thinking that um, they were um, sort of uh, taking shortcuts and um, making sacrifices. And one of the first things that we talk about in the workshop is it's not about making sacrifices, it's about making choices. So, mm -hmm. you know. If, if along the way you can find um, you can find a, a smarter way to do something that saves you time, you know, here, then maybe you can use some of that saved time to uh, make this part of the project uh, a little more robust. But you're not going to know what those uh, those trade-offs are until you start making some choices and making some recommendations. And I think people tend to sometimes be a little afraid to put themselves in that consultative role. So this this really does focus a lot on um, being more collaborative and and taking on that consultative perspective. Excellent. Well, if you want to learn more about the workshop that Tracy and Trina have been talking about, or if you want to learn more about any of the different learning opportunities going on at DevLearn, please do visit our website, devlearn14.com. DevLearn takes place in Las Vegas, October 29th through 31st, and you can learn about Trina's workshop and the other workshops, Trina and Tracy's workshop, and the other workshops that are taking place on October 27th and 28th via that website. Again, devlearn14.com to learn more about the conference and the workshops. Trina and Tracy, I want to thank you for spending some time having a chat with me this afternoon. Great, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And we thank you for watching. We'll see you next time on Twist Conversations. Take care, everybody. Bye. <laughs>